I have a question for you, though. In your house, in your family, in your marriage, what is the, the one thing that brings up tension? Money. Money. You? Well, we're praying for you. Actually, we're praying for Anne. She's pointing to you. There's something. Each relationship has like a tension thing, doesn't it? In, if you're married... The tensions are typically money, kids, and then sex, and not necessarily in that order, but those are the top three. But there are things. One of our tensions in our marriage, Sarah doesn't have any tensions because she's married to me. (laughs) Let's get that out of there. Should I... Should I be baptizing anyone today after that? No. No, I shouldn't. But one of the tensions, it's not even a tension as much as it just drives me crazy, is that I will put something down. Like, let's say this is my coffee cup. I'll put that down, and I'll walk, and I'll go do something, and I'll come back, and it's gone. And I'm absent-minded enough to think that I lost it. So I'm like, where's that coffee? And then this 25 years, 25 years this has been happening. And then it hits me, oh, she poured it away. But pouring coffee away and putting the cup in the sink is like pouring gold down the drain to me. (laughs) So that's a tension thing that gets me. But it's not really a big deal. I have this habit of, of buying books and reading books and stacking books. If you've been over our house, there's a library. It's a big library of a lot of books. But those books are all over the house. They're all over. Bless you. And one of the questions there is, like, why can't you keep them in one spot? Because I don't sit still long enough to keep them in a spot. But it's a tension grabber, Right? You know that the struggle is real with tension in your life, just like I know. Now, we have struggles. The coffee cup, that doesn't matter. End of the day, it doesn't matter, right? But we have struggles in our life about doing the right thing and doing the wrong thing, living according to our flesh or living according to our spirit. This morning, many of you are here because there are, there are 15 people that are going to be baptized. They're saying, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. I am going to profess that with baptism. I want to show the world that I belong to Jesus Christ. We're starting our series in Romans 8, but we're going to take a click back to Romans 6 first. Because when we look at baptism, it's a symbol. And it's that symbol meant to show that you love and you put your trust in Jesus Christ. Baptism is an outward sign of an inward decision. In many ways, baptism puts to rest the argument of who you are going to follow and what your life is going to look like. Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. What's a new life? What's your new life look like? Does it look like your old life, but with a Life of Christ t-shirt on? I don't know. I'm asking, you're, what's the new life? What, what does the new life look like? Have, have we changed? The new life is this. It is life in Christ through the Holy Spirit. Philosopher, social critic, and writer for London Daily Observer, G.K. Chesterton, was addressed by a woman who wrote a letter. And she asked him to write a series of articles trying to explain what was wrong with the world. The following day, Chesterton penned this classic reply. Madam, I will tell you what is wrong with the world in two words. I am. Sounds harsh, doesn't it? I am. What's wrong with the world? I am. Not a political problem or an economic situation. 
the real reason for the problems of the world is you and me personally. And what is responsible for the problems within us? Sin. It's the sin in us. And that sin causes problems to come pouring out of us, which affect the world around us. Sin is the problem. Sin is the issue. That's what it is. Romans 6.11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. How many of us know that there's a right and wrong in this world? We know there's a right and a wrong. And how many of us, you don't have to raise your hand on this one because it could get awkward. <laughs> we don't always count ourselves dead to sin. But sometimes we, we pick sin. We actually choose sin. But Romans 6.11 says this. It says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive. That alive means unbroken fellowship to God in Christ Jesus. How many of you have a, a snap streak going? If you don't know what a snap streak is, don't worry about it. I don't have time to talk about it. You'll shake your head anyway and be like, oh, kids. All right, snack streaks, streak, snap streaks. Raise your hands. All right, how many of you have, have sent a text to someone every day for a certain amount of time? That's like a snap, right? A streak. So what it is is What's your streak at, you guys? You have a streak together? Almost 1,600 consecutive, yes. I, ha I don't have, I have six, and those are like years ago. I don't know. I tried it, and it didn't work. It didn't fit. But they have unbroken fellowship on Snapchat. I'm not saying do that. I'm not. But it's a good example because... Because it shows the commitment. They're committed. I've watched this happen. I can't go to bed without sending a snap to Cabri. Oh my, we're going to lose our snap. Okay, start over. Mmm, terrible words. Terrible words. But sometimes we break a streak, snap, or with God, because of a choice. Even if the choice is that we simply forget because we're doing something else, because something else took place. But back to Romans, Paul says that the, the power of sin brings destruction. Boy, that sounds terrible, doesn't it? It would have been a lot better if it was raining out and I said that. You'd feel like it was right. But it's true. Have you ever noticed that most everything that you're ashamed of is always, in your life, is always linked to sin? I'm going to say that again. Have you noticed that almost everything in your life that you are ashamed of is directly linked to sin? You're not ashamed of helping someone. You're not ashamed of loving God or loving people. But sin gets in the way. So even though we're ashamed of it, the preoccupation with sin brings both depression and exhaustion at times. I remember last year, Sarah and I were riding our bikes on, this, on the trail, and we only did this like twice. So it's a very vivid memory. And Sarah goes a lot slower than, let's say, if Bo and I would go. So it's just a very slow, nice pace. And we were passed by this I'm going to say elderly couple, because they were twice our age, and they were on a tandem bike, and they passed us. I think we saw them too, Bo, at one time, but anyway, they passed us like we weren't even moving, and I'm a little competitive, and I'm like, oh my, like I just have to sit here, like my goal is to not be passed, but imagine that we have two people riding a tandem bike, tandem bike, they're both on the same bike doing the work together. And they're going up this hill. And they finally make it to the top of the hill. And the guy in the front says, man, I didn't think we'd ever make it to the top. I thought we'd end up rolling back down. Me too answers the guy in the back. That's why I kept the brakes on the whole time. 
But the same thing happens to us as Christians, doesn't it? We say, I get it. I know what Paul is saying. I don't want to fall back down that hill. I don't want to roll back into my flesh making the choices and giving in to those desires day after day. So I'm going to put the brakes on. I'm going to hit those brakes really hard. And I'm going to go back to all those rules and all those regulations so that I might not sin. So we're holding on to those rules and regulations that we think will break our fall from sin, but it only leads us to exhaustion and depression. And then we discover that even then, we're not able to keep them. If you're having a bad day, a bad week, a bad month, Romans 8 is for you. We're going to spend the next three weeks in it. It may be that you're haunted by something in the past, anxious about something that is happening right now or in the future, or weighed down by something that you're facing today. But Romans 8 will give us some clarity because sometimes we get stuck between the rules and the freedom. Can I have a show of hands how many rule followers we have? How many of you love the rules? Wow, that hand cannot go any higher. You love them. One of, if I may, one of Becca's sayings that I say that she actually likes a lot is to be unclear is to be unkind. Is to be unkind. And that's very, that a rule follower loves that. Mike, you like to follow rules, right? So you understand that. Rule followers, again, just up. All right. These are the guys that you want to organize the party. If you're not a rule follower, hands up. If you're like, rules? Who are those made for? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Remember that when membership comes around, Ed. Those are the guys that like to party. But we think that those rules and those regulations, they will break our fall, but they don't. And Paul understands this as he writes Romans chapter 8. If I had to give you a quick title, if you didn't have it in your Bible, I would say this is like the but and the how. But now, how? Romans 8, 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because, Christ, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. What does it set you free from? The law of sin and death. So for those of you that are trying to do those rule things, you're off the hook. Don't, we're just pausing, though. We're not letting you get a free, because you're, you're the partiers. No, you're not. You're the rule followers. But the key here is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, and listening to the Spirit. This may be the most significant single chapter in the Bible on the Holy Spirit. It's mentioned 19 times, the Holy Spirit is. Romans 8, 5, 11 goes on and says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. We're going to pause there. Have you ever had this really good meal and you've thought about going back to that place wherever it was and trying to have that same meal again? And then you get closer and what starts to happen? You start thinking about it more and more. Some of you are like, yeah, and more. Well, that's not your spirit. That's your flesh. <laughs> but the flesh does that with other things as well. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. They're not the same. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. If you could get one thing in this world, most people would say, I want some peace. I want some rest. But yet we often, we follow the flesh, and in the flesh we don't find life and we don't find peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. I see our flesh as the 
two-year-old versions of ourself. I love, like, AJ's in the back, and he's like, he's almost two, right? Just about two. And you could hear him, like, every so often, he just says what he wants. <laughs> Whatever. I know that guy. Whatever. Think of a two-year-old overtired. That's kind of what your flesh acts like. I want this. I'm going to do it. Very rarely will a two-year-old say, you know what, I'm not going to eat that Rice Krispie treat with the fruity pebbles and the marshmallows in it. I'm going to pass on that because that's probably not good for my body. <laughs> I need more protein. That's a lot of carbs. That's not keto. But if it's organic, can I do it if it's organic? It's not a two-year-old. No. Growing up, we'd go down these metal slides. Many of you went down those metal slides. They were hotter than blazes. That was like the world teaching us like a, a little bit of what hell might feel like. <laughs> and we'd have shorts on because you're in the summer. And a two-year-old, you're like, no, you don't want to go. You don't want to go down that. You don't want to do that. Oh, I can. And, you know, of course they don't even. They just they just go. They get up to the top. It's it's not good. They come down and they're actually holding their bum. But you know what they do? Oh, let's do it again. <laughs> it's kind of what our flesh is like. Last Yesterday we had VBS, and, and the, the culminating craft, like the, the, the big craft was, and let me tell you, I'm like crazy, worried, was worried about this. They, they tarp the floor off, and they paint it on the floor. Yeah, where are you? Yes. <laughs> And then they, they, they gave all the kids paint. It was, it was washable. Yeah, I know. I was in the bathroom washing it last night. <laughs> but we gave the kids paint. And, there was the, and so they had all these different colors, right? And you know how some kids are like, oh, I only want to use two colors. And then there's like, then there's always, give me, the, give me it all. I want it all. Right? So I'm like, you want it all? I'm going to give you orange and green. Have fun mixing those, because you know what that's going to look like. <laughs> and it looked exactly like that. They're, they're painting these beautiful light switches, which was a great idea. But you know what color they looked, half of them turned out? Brown. Brown. <laughs> Kids don't know how to govern their flesh. <laughs> so they mixed it all up, and they painted this really nice gift that they gave to their parents, which is a brown light switch. <laughs> I have more to say about that, but I'm not going to. <laughs> but I want you to remember, that's the idea of the flesh, and that's without the Spirit. Verse 9 says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but you are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. Hmm. So right now you're like, is that me? I hope that's me. Do I act like a two-year-old all the time? It's all good. We're outside. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. Verse 10. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Paul is writing that there are two basic ways to live. You can choose flesh or you can choose spirit, and it is up to you. We have this freedom, and we have the freedom to choose God's way, which leads to life and peace, or we can choose our flesh, which Scripture says leads to death. Verse 11 goes on, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, Living in you means makes his home in you. Have you been to someone's house before for the first time and they're like, yeah, the bathroom's there, cupboard's there, fridge is there, go ahead, I don't care. Have you been there? They're making you at home. They're not lazy. They're just letting you do your thing. And then there's some people, you go to their house and you're like, 
can I sit? No. Can, nope. Oh, I'm just going to stand for like 10 seconds and then I'm going to leave because I don't feel at home here. Yeah, Anthony, I know. I'm thinking. We know these things, right? That spirit is living in us, though. It makes home inside of us. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives inside of you. You don't have to do it on your own. You don't have to make it up that hill on your own. Life to your mortal body means choosing to live by the Spirit over our flesh. We have that choice as we live with the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is, is, is the helper promised to us by the Lord Jesus. And he dwells within the heart of every believer. If we hear his, his voice and listen, because you can hear and not listen, but if you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit and listen and obey, we can receive power to fulfill God's wonderful purpose for our lives. The Spirit teaches us. The Spirit helps us to know the truth. If you don't know what the truth is, I encourage you to spend more time in your Bible and then listen to the Holy Spirit. But without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we could easily fall into sin deception, and error. He is the source of God's truth and the revealer of God's wisdom. You see, if we are children of God, the Holy Spirit will lead us. When we are led in worship, we are not putting confidence in our flesh. The Spirit motivates us to say, you know what? Can I pray for you today? Is there something I can do for you? There are times when our normal wisdom will fail, when we don't know what to do. Holy Spirit's there. When you are at the end of your rope, you are not at the end of the rope of the Holy Spirit. Remember that. We are empowered by the Spirit, though. He helps us in our weaknesses and helps us when we pray. So even though those laws were good at a time, now we have the Spirit and we need to listen to the Spirit because the Spirit gives us boldness, it gives us confidence, and it gives us strength. How many of us want, we want to be alive, right? We don't want to, to live dead. So if we choose life in the Spirit, it may look like this. It may you may choose good over evil. Very simple. You may choose truth over lies. That may even be truth over a white lie. I want to encourage you. Get rid of the white lies in your life. Get rid of the small lies. Because that's not living in the Spirit. It might mean... Choosing purity over pornography. It may mean choosing mercy over judgment. Forgiveness over grudges. Life in the Spirit may, may mean that I choose joy over discontentment. I may choose patience over agitation. I may choose humility over pride. If we did a number of those things, it would really be me changing and then you changing. And if enough of us do that, what happens? The world changes. It does. It's that simple. But we can't change in the flesh. We have to change in the spirit. Those of you who have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, many of you have been baptized in this, in this tent. But for those of you who don't know why we do it, the way we do it, I want to give you just a few pointers. Going under the water 
is a burial of your old life, and coming up out of the water is a resurrection. Baptism declares that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. It is a public confession to your faith and your commitment to Jesus Christ. The Bible teaches it is the next step after salvation. So after you repent and you have faith in Jesus Christ, it really puts feet to your faith. You say, you know what? This is what I want to do. I want to be associated with Jesus Christ. It is a symbol meant to show the world that you love and you trust and you put your hope in Jesus Christ. It's also a symbol of head-to-toe cleansing. You see, God who made all of us understands that the physical is linked to the spiritual. He understands that there's this connection and that, that baptism points to the new life that we've been talking about for the last 20 minutes. That's where it starts. If you want references, you can look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Go back to Romans chapter 6. But these are some things you need to know about baptism. Baptism does not make you a believer. It shows that you are already a believer. Baptism confirms our position in Christ. Baptism does not save you. Only your faith in Jesus Christ will save you. Baptism connects us to the body of Christ. How many of us have been baptized? Just raise our hands. A lot of us have been baptized. We're connected together. I had a lot of questions about baptism. Like, am I worthy? No, you're not. Let's just get that out of the way. But because of Jesus Christ, you are. Will I be ready? When will I be ready? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Yes, you're ready. It's really that simple. Sometimes, I hate to say it, but sometimes the church complicates things. Really. If this was 2,000 years ago, and I said, do you have faith in Jesus Christ? And you said, yeah, I do. And I say, have you been baptized? And you said, no. I say, we're going to the ditch. And we'd go to the ditch, and we would do it there. We would do it where, where we could. Now, this is a nice service, and, and, and we have a clean pool and all that stuff. But baptism really is simple. For those of you that today is your day, I would like you just let your nerves go. Let them go. It's easy. It is. Really, the people in the pool do most of the work. I want you to, to be open, though. Because this is, a, this is spiritual. Although it's physical, it is spiritual. We cannot disconnect those. So there's times where people, when they're being baptized, they hear directly from God. The Holy Spirit speaks right to them. Brings stuff to our minds that, whoa, what, what is that? So I want you to be open to that. And sometimes if we're so worried about, oh, what's Pastor Jim going to do? Is he going to hold me under until I'm clean? <laughs> I'm baptizing Mike, who's really one of my closest friends. We don't have long enough to hold people down until they're clean. <laughs> I love you, brother. I told him today, I've been waiting to do this for years. No, don't worry about this. So just, that's just, can we just relax? A nice pick. <laughs> <laughs> but can we just enjoy this profession of faith together as a body? I think we can. Church, let's stand and pray. If you are one of those that I just, just spoke to, I want you to, you're going to head inside, you're going to meet Coach inside, and she's going to take care of the next step, and then I'll meet you back out here in about 10, 15 minutes. Everyone else, feel free to just drink that coffee and whatever else you want to do over there. I don't care. All right, let's pray. God, we come before you, and I thank you that we don't have to climb this hill alone. Holy Spirit, I ask right now that as we make decisions, as we go through life, that we have open ears to the Spirit, that we obey the Spirit, God. 
God, I pray for those of us that are still giving into the flesh, that we're choosing flesh over flesh over flesh, that today we draw a line the same way, you know, and we say, you know what, I, I'm done with the flesh. I want to live in the Spirit. I want a life that is different than the life that I've had before because that life is not working. God, I pray blessing over everyone here in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.